Sciences and my research has been mostly in the area of migration and particularly in migration from, from the Central European region, from Slovakia to, to the western parts of, of, <clears throat> of Europe. And what I will talk about today is a particular story connected to migration when migration kind of influences the, the big, big uh, history. Okay, so the outline of what I will talk in the next few minutes. Uh, first, the, the whole thing I will talk about is what happened actually about the, to, uh, after the EU was enlarged in 2004 with regard to migration. In 2004, 10 new EU countries members, 10 new EU countries from the central eastern part of Europe, former communist country, eight former communist countries and two islands, Cyprus and Malta became EU members. And I will talk about what, what were the expectations before, what actually was decided in 2004 with regard to transition periods. The old EU members, they could introduce transition periods. What did they do and how, how did they work with the data they had? So then, what, then I will talk a little about what actually happened, who migrated, who came, who migrated, when and, and why, and how many of those actually who, who moved stayed and I will particularly talk about the UK, how, how, how did it affect the UK. And then I, then I come, come to the conclusion where the simple migration flows kind of influence big European politics. And that's when how, how, how migration from Central and Eastern Europe is connected to the Brexit, the later 2007 EU enlargement, and, and what, what, uh, what were the consequences for the, for, with regard to public opinion in, in Britain and, and the outcome of the, of the referendum on Brexit. So, before 2004, in the countries, particularly in the countries laboring with the Central and Eastern European countries, there was an awareness that uh, people will start to move westward. Before that, before 2000 three or, or, or even, even in the 70s and 60s, the right to move, the right to move freely within the EU was one of the four fundamental rights of the EU, was perceived as a rather un uncontroversial right. Didn't, didn't cause uh, much controversy when it was introduced. It is, it is said that it was supported by Italy at the time of the, <coughs> when, when, the, when the core of the EU was established, Italy was one of the few countries which actually produced Mig labor migrants towards Western Europe. And it's said that actually Italy was the, was the country who was pushing towards having this fourth freedom of moving labor within the EU. Uh, then later, in early 80s, Greece became an EU member, and then Spain and Portugal in, in later 1986 became EU members. And it became a bit of a concern, yeah? What, what, what will the people from Spain and Portugal do? Will they actually try to move westwards to, to France or to the UK or whatever. And uh, the notion of transition periods was born. And a particular like, in, interesting detail is that actually uh, when Portugal became member in 1986, Luxembourg, uh, they negotiated a 10-year transition period not to have that many Portuguese working in Luxembourg. Actually, uh, Almost no one came, and they cancelled the, the, period, the transition period after four years, I think. And actually, who was, who was concerned mostly? There were the, the countries bordering with the Central and Eastern European region. This would be Austria and Germany in particular. And if we look back at who actually produced the predictions of how many migrants will come, and who ordered and who, who surveyed in this, in this area, it, was, it were mostly Austrians and Germans. I, I've taken a look at one of the latest predictions. It was published in 2003, and it worked with public, public opinion polls from 2002 when people in Central and Eastern Europe were asked, actually, would you consider moving westward? Would you, would you consider migrating? Can, can I use this water? Is this my... Okay, thank you. Very sustainable. And... One of the lessons was actually that the pr prediction could have been quite right if they focused on the right question. And the right question in this case was, would you like to move internationally? 
but, but the problem with the prediction which they did, or with the evaluation, how they, how they worked with the data was that they kind of saw the intention to move regionally as a precursor to international migration, while micro-inclusion in an article from two, in 2008 was rather that these two are two separate things, intention to migrate internally within the country and intention to migrate internationally. They are not a, on a continuum. But, but generally, asking people if they will move and if they don't, it worked. And it, you could, if you would do, uh, 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 you would like to separate countries, the ones which will engage a lot in migration after 2004 and those who, who won't, you could rely on those data and could have quite valid uh, findings from this. Also, the UK, obviously, they did their predictions when, they, when, they, when they, they had to decide, actually, if they will open the labor market, if they will uh, use the transition period, which was available at the time. They could have introduced a seven-year transition period. And when considering if to do so or not, they relied on the, on the report written by Dustman Casanova and, and colleagues and published in 2003. Uh, and the report became famous lately, later, after, after the enlargement, because it was simply very wrong in the, in the assumption that quite few people will actually come from Central and Eastern Europe. And their <coughs> expectation was that between 5,000 and 13,000 people annually will arrive to the UK from the Central and Eastern European countries. They did add a, another sentence, well, it could be a bit more if Germany and Austria uses the transition period and, and they remain the, their, their labor market remains closed. Yeah, it could be a bit more. But that was, that was the report, basically, that the UK's decision was based on to open the labor market right in 2004 for Central and Eastern European people. OK, so what happened actually in, in 2004? On May 1st, 2004, almost 15 years from, from now, 10 new EU members, about 10 new countries became EU members, including Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Slovakia, Slovenia, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, and Poland. Uh, these countries gained full labor market access only in three out of the then 15 EU countries. These three countries included the two English-speaking countries, the UK and Ireland, and also Sweden, which didn't become an interest, didn't become a popular destination among the migrants, contrary to the UK and Ireland. Uh, what's important, all the other EU countries, they used the, their rights to, extra, uh, to restrict free labor market movement or free movement of people, and, but only two of them, in the end, Germany and Austria, they used the full seven-year transition period. All the other countries, they eventually canceled the transition period before that. But as I, as I mentioned, uh, the prediction of 5,000 to 13,000 people arriving annually received a lot of laughs when the first actual figures were published two years later. This is a cartoon from a British tabloid in, published in August 2006, so a bit more than two years later after, after the accession. I was at the time in the UK, I, I bought this new paper, I have, the, I have them at home, and so you understand the joke. Uh, also, the British perspective, Central and Eastern Europe, and migration from Central and Eastern Europe translates into migration of the Poles. We will see, we will see why Poland is obviously the, the biggest of the Central and Eastern European countries, and that's why the Poles were the most visible in this regard. So, not surprisingly, after the 2004 enlargement, there was another round of EU enlargement in 2007, which included Bulgaria and Romania. In this case, UK imposed a seven-year transition period, which is important for our story because it will lapse just in 2014. So, how did actually this post-2004 migration wave look like? It looked like a wave. It's here. Uh, these are absolute figures. These are absolute figures of inflow of people. We have the uh, six countries providing the majority of, of the immigration. And as you see, this, this top line is this migration from Poland. That's why 
This is a, in the EU, not only in Britain. This is only in Britain, in only Britain. towards Britain. Yeah, these are these are national insurance need, the registration numbers. You ha, you have to have this one uh, to be able to work uh, in in Britain, and you can get you could get one this one this one since 2004 without labor permit, and just like any other any other British citizen. So you see. We see a first peak here in 2007, then the crisis onsets, and then we have a slight recovery here. But when we look at the absolute figures, this is a story about Polish migration to the UK because Poles were clearly the, the most, the largest group, o over two thirds of the whole C U Central East European migration to the UK was from Poland. We see the other countries here, Latvia, Lithuania being later the biggest, uh, second and third biggest providers of, of people to the UK. But what's more interesting for migration research is the second perspective, and this is migration per capita. This is migration to the UK per capita. So we take into account that Poland is a big country, has 40 million inhabitants, and we take into account that Slovakia has 5 million inhabitants, and we divide the figures by the size of the countries. So we see we have actually two other countries at the top, and these are the Latvia and Lithuania, two Baltic countries. And we have, we don't have Slovenia here because it basically would copy the, the bottom line here. There's almost no migration from Slovenia to the UK, even per capita if we, if we take into account that Slovenia is a tiny country with two million inhabitants. And we have also a different dynamics. We have this first peak in 2000, then uh, we had some economic growth here in the Baltics, and then we have an onset of the crisis in, the, in Lithuania and Latvia, and again, a large numbers of Latvians and Lithuanians uh, going to the UK. While when we look at Poland, for example, this is this, this line, we have this peak in 2007, we have seen this on the previous graph, and we have a decline there, small recovery here, but nothing, still nothing compared to, to the per capita migration from Latvia and Lithuania. So what explains the difference is why, why, so, many, why so many migrated from, from Latvia and Lithuania, why so few from Slovenia, relatively, relatively little migration from the Czech Republic, Estonia also. Uh, this is another view, this, is, uh, like, this was the inflow and this is the stock also per capita, we see that actually Latvia, Lithuania, they were not even, we had a half, half of the numbers with Poland and even Romania with its small uh, fast growth after 2014 didn't reach the levels per capita uh, of migration to the UK. So this is just what, what happened stock-wise, how many people from the Central and Eastern European region were in the UK, and we see by the time Romania and Bulgaria joined the EU, there were over half a million, uh, two-thirds or three-fourths of, of it from Poland, and then at the time of uh, the, the, this, the decision to have a referendum on EU, uh, on, on, on breaking up the, with the, or, or going away from the EU, there were half a, one and a half million Central and Eastern European people in the UK. Uh, so, so, so what what explains that from some countries there was little migration, from other countries there was more migration? The most notorious explanation is obviously the economic one. Yeah, neoclassical migration says that basically, where well, the wage differences are big, the the bigger the wage differences, the larger the larger the incentive to to migrate. The more the more sense it makes to the people to change location, do probably the troublesome journey or whatever, find an employment, find, find a place to live and start working in a, in a country which has a higher wage level. And this is, this is a comparison of how, how different were the wage levels in the EU8. I call the EU8 the can the Central and Eastern European countries from the EU10, so the, the Cyprus and Malta are not included. And we see that in 2004, the wage level in the UK was over 11 times higher than in Latvia. 
very much similar for Lithuania. You see 7.4 times higher than in Slovakia, very similar with other V4 countries, 6.3 for Czech Republic and 3.8 for, for Slovenia. We've seen, we see there was some convergence over, over the 10 years I have covered here. What's the ratio? The ratio at the end is how much actually, or how, how much the difference diminished in the 10 years. So we see that Latvia and Lithuania, uh, 10 years later after the accession were at around 50% higher, or, or the ratio between their wages and the wages in the UK improved by, by more than two. Also the, the other countries of the Visegrad 4 group, uh, quite some improvement in Estonia, little improvement, for example, in Slovenia, but also remember they, they started from, from a higher, higher position. So it made less, less sense to migrate in 2014 than it made in 2004 from, from the perspective of the Central Eastern European countries. And also we see the basic patterns, the most migration prone countries, Latvia, Lithuania, having the highest incentive to, to migrate because the wages the wage level in the in Latvia and Lithuania was way, 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 way lower than, than what was expected in the UK. Uh, it's a very similar table, but just comparing the average income with the minimal wage in the UK. So still uh, earning a minimal wage in the UK would mean you had almost five times the, five time the income you could have at home from the Baltic, from, from the two Baltics, in the two Baltic countries, and you had the round three times higher income uh, when, when you were living from the Central, Eastern, Central European region. Uh, what needs to be said, when we discussed wage inc uh, labor income differences, the most like, notoriously studied case is the case of, uh, uh, of migration from Mexico to the United States. And in migration, when, mi when studying migration from Mexico to the United States, we have to know that the wage differences between Mexico and the US were around in the area between three and five. So it's, it's ra rather something we have here than we had here. So these, these wage differences were higher than between Mexico and the, and the US. So quite a strong incentive actually to, to go and work, work in the UK for people in the Central Eastern Europe. Uh, this is another table just showing that there is really a <coughs> notable and significant correlation between the wage levels in the countries and between, between the numbers per capita of how many, how many people migrated to the UK. Uh, and just a just graphical uh, proof of what I've been saying. You have per capita migration here. You have a wage level here. You see the, the higher the wage level, the lower the per capita migration. These are a migration figure from the census in 2011, and these are average wage levels for, for the 2004 and 2011 period. Okay, going, going next. So, uh, I've demonstrated that the wage differences work in explaining how many people, how many people go and leave which country, but The question I would like to answer is that actually I've been talking about people going, and what explains people going, but um, it seems that there were quite large differences within those countries who had a very similar per capita out-migration uh, with actually how many, how many of those people stayed in the UK. The stock of, of Slovakians and Polish people were quite different. So, so why was that? And this is what I would like to explain. This is <clears throat> out of the people who kind of left in, the ten, in 10 years, in 2014, all those people who, who went to the UK, got a national insurance number and worked there for at least a month. In 10 years later, you had approximately 60% of them still in the UK for Poland, and you had approximately 40% of them from Slovakia still in the UK. So, so why is this difference? This, this is another, another graph which, which like shows the difference. We see almost similar level of per capita migration from, from Slovakia and from Poland. 
It's very, very similar and very, the dynamics is very similar, but a very distinctively different level of actually stayers of those people who stayed there. Uh, I was pursuing the idea that perhaps this could be connected to the way how people migrate, how much they rely on migration networks. Because uh, the economy is what provided the, the, the explanation that actually is the income, which explains who, who goes and who doesn't. Well, and sociology is, the, is behind the theory that actually migration networks play a very important role in migration dynamics. So I was thinking perhaps this, this is the case. And to prove it or to prove it wrong, I, I relied on, these are local authorities in the UK. There are 400 local authorities in the UK. And we have a figure of income, of inflow of people from each of the Central East European countries to every of these local authority levels. So what I did was I, was compare, I, I compared year on year inflows from the EU eight countries and compared how similar these are with relation, uh, geographically. If, if poles like, tend to constantly go to these regions more frequently than, than to this region, or if it, or there is no similarity year on year uh, <clears throat> with regard to where people go in the UK. And if you, if you do an examination of this, you get such a, such a correlation pattern. And what turns out that, for example, there is a constant difference in the similarity between where, peop where people from Poland went and where people from Slovakia went. So the, the regional pattern of migration from Poland was every, every single year more similar than the regional pa pattern of Slovaks uh, who went to the UK. So I, I see this as, a, as an indirect proof that actually there could be migration networks behind this. And if people use migration networks when they, when they, when they migrate, it has a different effect on how probable is that you will actually settle in the country, how easy is it for you to get to the country even if you don't speak the language. Remember just all the grandmothers from Poland being brought by, by, by young Polish couples, for example, to take care for their children. This is all this network migration. And those people following using the migration networks, they don't have to be that familiar with the country when they are traveling to than if you go on your own and don't rely on your compatriots. Okay, so the summary, summary so far is that wage level differentials did explain the differences in migration between EU8 countries and the UK quite well. However, the significant difference between migration flows and migration stocks seem to be, seem to be well explained by migration networks and we need to use migration networks theory to explain this. And how does this, this all relate to Brexit? So just, just a small reminder on how the Brexit referendum timeline evolved. Uh, the Prime Minister Cameron made a promise that he will hold a referendum on EU membership on January 2013. There were general elections in the UK in May 2015, which, uh, which the Conservative Party won, also due to this promise. And so they introduced this act on EU referendum in September which came into full legal force in February. And on the 20th of February, the day of the referendum was announced, which was in June the same year and resulted in a 51.9% vote to leave, to leave the EU. I will show you a few pictures from the, from the vote leave take control campaign, which is still, still online. That's the, that's the page of the campaign to, to leave in the referendum. And this is, this is one, of, one of the things why you should, what happens if, if, Britain's, if the Britain, British will vote to stay in the EU? What will happen? EU will be joined by Turkey and all the guys from Turkey will go to the UK. Moreover, Albania, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia and Turkey uh, will also, also join the EU. And, and all, all of them will go to the UK. Uh, and immigration will continue to be out of control. This is what they written in 2006. Nearly 2 million people came to the UK from the EU over the last 10 years. Imagine what it will be like in future, in future decades when new poorer countries will join. And 
Just remember the timing. In 2007, Britain introduced the transition period of seven years for the, British, for the Romanians and Bulgarians. We joined the EU in 2007 on, on January, so the seven-year period lapsed in January 2014. And we have, a, we have this, yeah, we have this high, high bump in 2014. We have 150,000 registrations for work from Romania and almost 50,000 from Bulgaria, growing further through 2015 and 2014. And these are the figures coming in when, when the referendum was decided. Okay. Okay. So being aware of all this, I wrote an opinion piece for a Slovak new newspaper on April 27, still before the referendum. And the title was, If the Polish Plumber Will Get the British Out of the EU. Uh, one of my points was actually that the, the migration from Central and Eastern Europe in the UK is far more visible than the old migration to the UK. Why is it more visible? Because it is less, less concentrated in the urban areas and it, uh, it <clears throat> is largely geographically spread towards the countryside of the UK, which was before that unused to, to having immigrants. Uh, okay, so and, and as, as, as this is how it looked like, and it seems that my, well, my guess was, was right. First, first figures uh, came from The Economist in 2016. There was the seemingly paradox that this area where you had high migration, you had high levels of, of, of saying remain, and in the areas where you didn't have much migrants, there were high levels of, of, of saying, saying let's leave. But if you look at the, at the rights actually, at the levels how, how migration was growing in the area, then the areas where you had the highest growth of immigration were the areas most likely to actually vote for, for Brexit. And this, like, it's always the academy, they, they, came, they come later as the journalists, so this is, a, the, is, this is from the journal of British Journal of Politics and International Relations, published in 2017. And basically they say that though the, the, the when, when, when people were asked what was important, they say that the message of taking back control was important, but they say that this taking back con con control, it, it, it turned out in the qualitative interviews, what, what people meant and to this taking back control was very closely connected with immigration. It was taking control over, also over, over immigration to the, to the UK. And the result of, of their analysis that is basically that, that strong public concerns over immigration and its perceived effects on the country and on its communities were central to explaining the 2016 vote for Brexit. But let's not leave the British alone in this. A recent article published in 2018 had used the Eurobarometer sur survey for the whole EU or for the old EU countries and they have found that the greater presence of Central and Eastern European citizens living in a Western Euro European country was associated with a greater public concern whether the country benefits from European membership and this was the hypothesis which was supported. That actually uh, a percentage increase of the proportion of new European citizens in the population is associated with an increase of 74 uh, in percentage of the population who feel that EU membership is not beneficial to their country. So not only in UK, migration from Central and Eastern Europe is not popular with the public, with the public in Western Europe. Okay, so my conclusion here, as I think I was able to demonstrate, the timing of the Brexit referendum was particularly unfortunate. Uh, if you've been following the, med the news at the time, there were very sensitive issues like when the figures of, on actual immigration will be published, if it will be published before the Brexit referendum or, or afterwards. There, was, there were some attempts by the uh, Home Office actually to postpone publishing the figures, which we just had these Romanians and Bulgarians spiking, spiking up. 
and, a, and a more wider question, which, which I, th I think is connected with what, what the other topics will be about. Actually, how sustainable is migration? When we speak about sustainability of migration, we usually just think about brain drain and people, what will the communities do without the people who actually have left? But they actually, in, in case of the EU, it showed that the, the, the free movement of people proved to be non-sustainable like internally for internal politics of the EU because it was that, that unpopular. So there is also sustainability from the receiving country population or perspective actually. How many migration can a country, can a country absorb not to explode like uh, politically and, and not to produce like unreasonable decision like just um, many people agreed that the Brexit decision would seem to be a very unreasonable unreasonable choice by the public made in the UK. Okay, so, so that's, that's for now, that's for me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.